So with regards to this overall topic, I will say this came to me in a bit of a fever dream. I was talking with a good colleague of mine and they were asking about, when we look at regulation, we look at all these standards that we are reacting to today, would we have been able to see this coming? And I was like, yeah, kind of, yeah, I think so. I think we, I think we could say that. Okay, so if I then were to say, could I take that hypothesis and now understand all of the standards that we have that are being implemented now, what would that mean for the future? And that got me thinking through a lot of these conversations that I wanna be able to have with you. So I'm gonna do this in a three part sort of conversation. The first part is understanding the ripple effect that happens with ICS security standards and regulations as you know and or love them today. And then I wanna be able to take the hypothesis of if I could understand what happened in the past, can I then extrapolate that, trend it out a little bit and understand what will happen in the future? What's the ICS security program going to look like in 2032? I hope to come back on the stage in 2033 maybe and say, I got some things right, mostly I hope. Uh, maybe I got a couple things wrong. So just hold me to that. Uh, and if I got a lot of things wrong, a, a round of drinks for everyone because that means that we really went off the rails somewhere. And I also wanna be able to then emphasize why I'm so confident in what I'm about to say. There is a new thing that got unlocked in the past year when I look at some of these new regulations. And I'll talk about that towards the end. So I wanna be able to give you this three-part discussion. How can I be confident about trending from the past going into the future. Then let's look at a meta-analysis of all the things that just took place, that just became part of a new standard or part of a new regulation that are gonna lock my system, my, my OT security program in place for the next 10 years. A little bit about me, uh, I've done this for a while. So uh, similar to Tim, like talking about the years and I actually have a couple of the years listed on this uh, slide deck did get me being like, oh, I've been doing this for a little bit of, a little bit of time here. Uh, I have a longer sort of history into standards and regulations, in particular with ICS security. I am an engineer by background, so I come from two engineering degrees, and then I accidentally got into cybersecurity, and just like regulation, I was locked in place for the next 20 years of my career. So why should we talk about this? Well, one, if you're not new to this, it's not going anywhere. Regulation is going to be a thing that you're going to continually react to. I'm gonna talk about that momentarily. And it's actually growing. 2022, as you're about to see, was the largest year of ICS security standards development and regulation implementation ever. Like take all the other years and look at what we're doing today. Last year was the year where we wrote the most requirement language for ICS security. And if you wait until it becomes mandatory and enforceable, if you wait until your organization has to react, it's going to be too late for you. So this is actually the graph I went through and I did a little bit of history project for myself. I went through and looked at all the different standards and regulations that have been produced over the past 20 or so years. And you can see here, we've got a couple of interesting patterns that ended up emergency. So I wanna look at this little trend line and this trend line is gonna follow us for a couple of slides as I tell the story. Because if you look at it from the perspective of, well, what happened when? One of the first things that I ever read, Urgent Action 1200, 2003. That, for those of you who are uh, in the NERC SIP realm, and if you're here for ICS 456, which I'm teaching later on this week, we're gonna talk about this a little bit more for a couple of days. That is what really kicked off a lot of the conversation for us in ICS security. It was looking at control centers. It was looking at what we could do to secure our assets there. And then we started seeing larger international growth. So ISA 99 committee, if you're familiar with ISA IEC 62443, this is where the origin story for that started. 2008 was a very big year. That's when NERC SIP became mandatory and enforceable. Or, sorry, that's when FERC actually approved them. And we also saw a lot of documentation coming out of DHS ICS CERT talking about how could we protect these things in sort of a guideline perspective and basis. And then you see this lull. We have this lull that happened where there were things happening. I don't want to say that we didn't produce anything. You can see from the bar chart, we did produce more standards, more regulations. It was in 2014 that we saw the NIST cybersecurity framework. So you could sort of see that six year period, the next big thing that most of us talk about is NIST CSF. Then we start seeing a little bit of uptick. ISA, IEC 62443 had a busy year in 2018, had a busy year also in 2020, to then whatever the heck happened in 2022. We saw this large peak that just happened last year. And if you weren't paying attention to it, I don't blame you. A lot of people who do ICS security your day-to-day -day job is keeping the lights on, 
keeping the things moving. You're probably not burying your head in what was released of like 12 or so documents of ICS security regulation. I, I really don't blame you on that. But my team and I were looking at sort of these trends and almost every single day, we were talking about something new or another meeting or another drafting team that was coming into being. And I started to sort of ask the question, were there any similarities across all of these things? I'll get to that in a moment. What I also want to though look at is the threat side. Because during the same time period, we had different evolving threats. And if you look at that first peak that happened in 2008, what were we really worried about? Code Red, Slammer, Configure. Did I get any like flashbacks for people who had to deal with like, We had IT centric worms that happened to find their way into our control system. Somebody plugged in something they shouldn't have, clicked on something they shouldn't have. And now I've got this thing that's like a nuisance, but that thing doesn't know it's in an industrial control system, right? It's not leading towards a necessary industrial control system impact in a lot of ways. It's something that I have to monitor. It's something that somebody did something bad, but it's not the same thing as what I see on the other side of this curve. What happened after 2008? It's not an ICS conference if that word does not show up on a slide. So thank you for everybody. You can thank me later. I put it on the slide. Nobody else has to do it going forward. We had Havocs, Black Energy 2, Black Energy 3, Dragonfly 2.0 campaign, Crash Override, Xenotime, the Trisis event, Petya, not Petya, and Destroyer 2 and pipe dream. Most of the things that we're worried about, most of the things that we talk about happened during this lull. The threats that we we're concerned with happened after we developed all these standards in 2008 that we're worried about sort of non-OT based things to suddenly becoming very OT based, very OT concerned. And so here is the background and the hypothesis that you need to understand about regulation. If I take this trend, I can absolutely guarantee you that it's going to repeat itself over and over again. Because at the end of the day, and this you're going to hear this a lot from folks who will, will actually give it an anti-regulation spin. They'll always tell you regulations lag behind threats. And that's true. It's a red herring argument, though, if you're trying to denounce the value of regulation. It's an absolutely true statement, but it'll always be the case. Because you don't want the other side of the equation where you have regulators coming up with like, Precognitive, like here's what the threats are going to look like in the next 10 years, and we're going to make a regulation for it now. It always has to lag behind. And so, as those threat activities build up, you have to expect that crest of the wave to come, and that's going to be your new regulatory environment. So, if you could take that approach, if you're smart, which after this presentation, you'd be like, I'm smart on this, you will know when change is coming. You should be able to trend and analyze when that change is about to hit. If you're good, you'll have a plan for it. And if you're lucky, as you build up that plan, it'll turn out to be what you're gonna be compliant to anyway later down the road. This is where I see most organizations be their most successful selves in OT security, because they have a leader that is looking at the trends, not just threats, but also what's happening in the standards and trying to figure out, okay, where do I need to break from what's happening right now? How do I plan for the future in that? It's actually a skill set that we teach in ICS 418. So let's go back and look at this a little bit because I wanna be able to really cement for you the background basis of what's happening. We've got a good 14 years of NERC SIP information, right? If I go from peak to peak of where we are now, 14 years of good SIP data that I could probably go through and say, how do I know what the program is going to be based off of what I've learned in the past? Well, this also depends on how you count SIP because you could count it from when it's mandatory and implementable, in which case is 12 years. Or you could be a real big nerd and say, well, it's been 19 years since urgent action 1200. At the end of the day, there's no real fascinating way to be able to say I count SIP in dog years. Um, this is actually where I felt the oldest where I'm like, oh yeah, it's been two decades of talking about some of this control language. But if I can look back at to what it is that we did in 2003, could I identify what it is that we do currently in 2023? I wanna give you an example of this. This will be my, my foundational element for us to be able to say, okay, now I can analyze the standards of today to move forward. If you're familiar with NERC SIP, you're familiar with the phrase ports and services. When it was in Urgent Action 1200, we talked about it as services and ports. And very clearly we said that you need to have some sort of policy that should allow you to disable unused network services and ports, applications that are running in your control system environment that shouldn't be running, system hardening for lack of better terms. 
You fast forward to an urgent action 1200 evolved into the NERC SIP standards. And you can see here, we put more language around it. But at the end of the day, we're still doing the same thing. We're talking about disabling other poison services that aren't needed for normal and emergency operations. We're hardening the system. Language, again, evolved a little bit. But the DNA of that is still the same. This led to some other internal debates. We talked about this in ICS 456, where we then started asking, well, what is a port anyway? And we had to have an interpretation request that came through and said, we're talking about logical ports only. But this started asking a question, well, what about physical ports? And then it evolved just a couple of years later when SIP version 5 came out. And we're now talking about not just having enabling only logical network accessible ports that have been determined needed by the utility, but also protect against the use of unnecessary physical ports. The evolution is there for the past 10, now 20 years. And so asking the question, if I were to time travel back, kidnap my younger self, he had more hair up here, less hair down here, bring him into a NERCSIP facility and talk about NERCSIP 7, would my younger self be able to identify that program? Absolutely. The technology is the same. He'd probably be a little bit surprised about the auditing approach, but the technology is the same. The way that you perform this task is the same. And it's been the same thing for 20 years. So if we get into our TARDIS, Instead, all of you come with me, and we can now go into the future based off the things that we know today from the standards and regulations that just passed. Would we be able to identify what happens in 2032, or would we be surprised? When we talk about forecasting, I want to make this very clear we're not talking about the ability to take out a crystal ball, it's not about prediction. When you talk about this from a managerial or leadership skill level, which is where we all need to go as ICS security professionals, right? If we don't have the ability to forecast a little bit, we're always gonna be reacting and never be able to get to a proactive state. It's not about prediction though. Think of it more like ophthalmology, which is way less exciting than talking about crystal balls. But what we wanna be able to say is that I wanna gain accuracy into what the future is going to look like. Again, if I come back in 10 years, I'd like to be able to say that we were roughly there Right? There are going to be some specifics maybe that, that I don't have a good keen insight into. Uh, we don't have any lasers or any like you know, super fancy sci-fi weapons when we talk about this thing. But we will have some of the unique basis of today that will see ripple effect into the future. So with that, it was actually one of the conversations of how do we analyze all the standards. So if I look at this again, this chart where you know that we're at this peak, there's going to naturally be a lull over the next few years. Once you have a drafting team and regulations and massive efforts across industry to create something new, you don't bring that team back the next year to start doing something new all over again. You give industry time to be able to understand how things are going, and then you'll ramp back up probably in a few years. So we're here. This was last year. This was the amount, and this is just a sampling. I had to like actually be a little bit uh, sort of conservative here, of all the different regulations and standards that took place. They are sector specific in some cases, they are regional in other cases. Uh, there's a lot of new things that are happening and hopefully you see something that applies to you here. If not, you should probably go check your homework because something here absolutely does apply to you. I almost guarantee it. If you're in North America, if you're in Europe, if you're in Australia, there's been a lot of activities that took place last year. So if we look at sort of the overall DNA of these standards, could this dictate our future? Could this dictate what's gonna happen over the next 10 years? I think you already know where I'm going with this. I was lucky enough after talking with Tim and Rob that they allowed me to gain access to SAN's state-of-the-art uh, AI ML laboratory to be able to crunch the numbers on all of the standards that we talked about. And you'll be surprised at the results that that thing was able to produce. It's a total lie. We don't have a state-of-the-art AI laboratory to analyze standards. I used a whole bunch of spreadsheets. This is the, the life of somebody who has to look at security standards. I actually hate doing standard mappings. It has been like my job for the past 20 years. Everybody wants to know how one standard relates to another standard. Taking a look at 20 standards is definitely stretching, I'd say the breadth of what a good map may look like. But let's take a look at some of those themes and sort of understand what this will mean for us again into the future. So what do these things have in common? I had to sort of go through literally thousands of document, pages of documentation to understand what are the themes that we need to look out for in the next 10 years. And so I wanna share that with you as part of not only being able to tell you you need to do forecasting, let's talk to you about what the forecasting actually looks like. 
So back into our TARDIS, we jump into the future. What are going to be the top three things that we're going to see in any ICS OT security program, regardless of where you are in the world, what your ownership structure is, what your size is? The very first one is going to be incident response and reporting. Come on. To the government. Aha. Uh -huh. With more stringent criteria than ever before. Uh, there was a lot in incident response and reporting. And frankly, I think this is not just because of the wave of the threats that we saw, but also under the backdrop of ransomware. We started seeing more operational outages as a result of that. And so the government now wants to know, can you please tell me when you're about to have an incident? And a couple of things that came out of this that were really interesting. One was strict timelines. If you're talking about, for example, the SEC guidelines, there are some very strict timelines as to what that may look like for you. If you want to talk about the latest uh, sort of laws and regulations that came out of 2002, where everybody in critical infrastructure is now going to have to report something to DHS, strict timelines are in place. Also then implied detection capabilities. This was kind of interesting for me because the amount of information that the government would like to get from you requires you to actually start looking for things that maybe you're not looking for currently. So even though it's called out as incident response, how do you know when you have an incident? It's not going to be the classic 1995 film, The Hackers. I don't have a virus singing, row, row, row your boat while it's capsizing things. That would make life really easy to detect an incident if I did. In ICS and OT, it may look like a maintenance event, a communications outage. How do you know for sure that you're having something that you can and have to report? That implies that we have some sort of detection that probably we don't have in a lot of our environments today. And know your material impacts. I actually really enjoyed Mark's conversation this morning. Uh, this whole idea of don't talk to me in jargon. Tell me what this means to the business. We don't do a good job of that, frankly, uh, especially if you come from the IT security side, you go into an engineering or operations environment, and you're talking about confidentiality, integrity, availability, that does not matter. Tell me what it means to production. Tell me what it means to safety, environmental impacts, national security impacts. Those are the things that you're going to be driven to do now in your incident response program if you're not doing that already. All right, what's the next one? It actually leads together pretty nicely. Industrial cyber risk management and executive engagement. If this is your first time being cued into that, I have an entire talk from last year walking through the journey of a CISO that did this really well only after doing it really poorly. And I unfortunately think a lot of folks are going to go through that. So please go look. That's another like 30 minutes of like free content that you can get. We've tied that back into ICS 418. There's a lot of good things there about how do I know to talk this language appropriately. Um, I don't want to say every system is going to need an MBA, but you're going to need to start talking business talk. And you're also going to have production-specific risk assessments. A lot of the different standards and requirements, TSA guidelines, uh, what you're getting at NIS2 in the EU, talk about specific things that are happening in your ICS environment from a vulnerability perspective and a threat perspective. You cannot take your IT risk assessment program and run it in your ICS OT environment. You're not going to get the right outputs. You're not going to be able to get that overall conversation you need to about those production outages and the things you really care about. The other thing that's really interesting is a few of them call out cost benefit analysis. I was not expecting that. So again, you're going to have to like get like a more business acumen in security than we've currently ever really had. And I would say including some bad advice. There are some of the requirements that I did look at that, frankly, if we put them into ICS OT, won't be the best option for us. Uh, for example, NAS2, when they talk about things that they want to do in ICS OT, they talk about encryption in our networks. Great for IT, probably going to be problematic when we talk about detection again in OT. So there's some balances that you're going to have to have there to be able to talk through that, and you have to be educated at it before you go forward. And educating the executives. So congratulations, executives have to get educated. It's not on them to learn our language, though. It's on us to learn theirs. So if you're catching a theme from this entire portion of this side, it's that now a CISO has to become a business leader. Similar to how the CFO is not really a operational position about 20, 40 years ago, and now is like the default protector of the entire organization, the CISO has to become that now. The industrial CISO in 10 years absolutely has to protect the entire business and understand how their protections mean for what that means for the overall organization. All right, and the last of the top three that you're going to see in 10 years, training and awareness. And I, I will not say this is not because I'm a SANS instructor that this one popped up. This was a common theme throughout. And it really comes down to the idea of where you're going to invest your time and money. If you have a dollar to spend, where are you going to put it in terms of the people, the processes and technology? The people can tell you when you have a bad process. The people can tell you when you need to buy new technology. 
The thing that's interesting about that is it also now includes executives. Executives have sort of been immune from the idea of how do I do training? And now specific things, again, like NIS2 in the EU, they have to do that. SEC guidelines are now pushing that on the people in North America as well. So your executives who previously probably just relied on the fact that you had a program, probably looked at a couple of metrics every quarter, now have to be able to speak a little bit better, a little bit more educated to it because they know what's going to come if they don't. This leads to cultural change management. We're changing the culture. We're changing the perception of security as a result. Again, a really good conversation that, that Mark sort of brought uh, into the morning session. This takes time. As a matter of fact, when we talk about this in ICS 418, the typical timeline to change a culture takes about five to 10 years. So, so that's why I picked 10 years in the future, because that's when we should start seeing that culture shift. Same thing happened with safety in the 1970s. As people were dying, it became a imperative to get better at safety. It took about 10 years, a little bit more in some cases, to get that culture of safety. And now when you go to any organization, you have safety moments, right? We've got the ability to talk about safety on an internet page. When was the last time we had a safety incident? All of those pieces now have to come into cybersecurity, and now cyber safety becomes one of the predominant themes that you're going to see throughout the organization. And training your internal auditors. This is fun, too. A lot of the new requirements require you to have plans, and you're about to get audited to your own plan. It becomes who watches the watchman. You don't want to find out that your plan is really bad when the auditor shows up on site. So now internal auditors, which in a lot of cases, frankly, a lot of ICS OT security teams that I work with, they don't want their internal audit team to be so cognizant as to what's happening. That needs to change because there's going to be now lines of reportability that have not existed before that are going to force this conversation to be a bit more mature. I do encourage everyone to embrace it. It's the exact same thing if I talk about the CFO, finance. If you want to be invited to the big boys table of, hey, I'm also an executive too as a CISO, you need to embrace the idea of internal audit. Nobody on the finance side says, oh, I, I, can't, I don't want internal audits. We're just going to keep on riding through it. They embrace it because it's part of finding gaps and addressing those gaps. There were also a bunch of runner-up. I couldn't really spend all the time talking about the themes, but I will tell you that every single regulation and standard that was developed in 2022 shares a significant amount of themes across each. The standards are different. The way that you talk about the different requirements, you definitely need to be able to read up on them. But in terms of the overall perspective of what they're concerned about, it's those top three. None surprising to anybody, supply chain came up time and time again. Same thing with any access management, which is something that we probably have a little bit more strengths that we can do in OT if we get it right. Same thing with asset management, because we're dealing with less identities and we're dealing with less assets in the IT side. But these are the things that you need to be able to, from a technology perspective, be aware is going to happen. Okay. If you've been plugged into ICS security and OT standards, you're going to say, all right, so what? Like, those are all themes that we've actually seen since 2003. A lot of them are. We've had bumps in the road, but we've always had conversations about incident reporting. We've always had conversations about risk management. I mean, NERC SIP had a weird one where we ripped it out and then trying to put it back in. We've had these conversations time and time again. So what is so different now? What took place in 2022 that was a little bit different in terms of the way that the laws are written? There's now a more complicated conversation on legal compliance. So if we think about the things that happened that, that sort of gave you that wave into 2022, while there were things like NERC SIP regulations, there weren't mandatory reporting requirements that had to happen at the end of an incident. Now there are. And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize, yes, the penalties are bad. Like I don't wanna say that they're not. $10 million uh, from NERC SIP, biggest one ever. Uh, NIS2 has got some really heavy penalty percentages uh, that could be levied against you. But at the end of the day, if you find yourself not complying with any one of those laws and you did have an incident, you could be now on the hook for criminal charges. This is what everyone in cybersecurity talks about when they talk about HIPAA, when they talk about PIA, uh, P PCI, and they talk about PII. When we talk about the standards that they need to follow, but they did not, and there was an incident, now the DOJ is going to investigate you. Think about that from an ICS security side. We have mandatory reporting requirements that are going to come for everybody across the board. And if there were to be an incident and it was deemed that you did not do a very good job in your compliance program, congratulations, you could probably see some of those heavier penalties come against you. The first one out of the gate, unfortunately, the first person who's going to have an ICS security incident that has led to a large outage, that's going to be a really rough day. This is the US sentencing guidelines from the Department of Justice here in the United States. 
And this is actually just updated in March. And they have specific questions to ask you if you did not do good on your compliance program. As the Justice Manual notes, there are three fundamental questions a prosecutor should ask. Is the corporation's compliance program well designed? That is something that requires you to look at your requirements and understand what's going well or not. Is the program being applied earnestly and in good faith? In other words, is the program adequately resourced and empowered to function effectively? If you're not resourcing it, you can find criminal charges perhaps. Does the corporation's compliance program work in practice? This is something we really haven't had to focus on before. Yes, you've had to comply with things because maybe you're worried about in Merck land getting those penalties. But now that we have these additional laws that are sort of stacking on top of this, if executives aren't going to invest in things by 2033, when I'm talking about jumping into the future, there's going to be a larger fiduciary risk for those boards of executives and C-suite members. When I talk to other executives and boards of directors, this is what they're concerned about. When they look into the future, they're concerned about what this may look like after those first few incidents that may lead to an outage. Which is why I'm more confident, which is why I could say if we examine the past, as we did with nerc -SIP, I can understand the evolution that will probably happen over the next 10 years. If I examine the themes that took place in 2022, I can now talk about what's going to happen 10 years from now. And because there's new laws and regulations, I can say you're going to get locked in. So what does the compliance program then look like 10 years from now? Well, for those of you who are familiar with things on either the safety side or on the finance side, you may be familiar with the three lines of defense, where the very first conversation for every uh, conversation at an organization is our governing body. And the first two lines of defense happen at the management level. The ability to say we are going to fund tools, fund people, do our daily activities, and we're also going to monitor them. That allows us to be able to address the risks as they change. And of course, there is this conversation about management reporting to that governing body. The third line, though, is that internal audit. Remember I talked about how that internal auditor is going to be somebody who has to be trained and ready? They now have to understand ICS and OT security as well as your own program does, because they're the ones who are also telling you where you have gaps. And this is one where most people freak out. They're also telling the same governing body. If done appropriately, and this is what we see in finance, this is what we see in safety, this is what we are going to see in ICS OT security, they are now jumping the shark. If you're not doing your job well, someone else may know at the exact same time that you do. So again, it forces the conversation. It forces there to be more. There's also external assurance providers. Those are people who are like saying, hey, how are you doing based off the laws? But overall, this has to mature because now again, we have the potential of criminal penalties if we don't do our job right. So there are a couple of models that you could leverage here. In ICS 14, we talk about the GOES model. It's come from safety, uh, specifically out of the nuclear sector, governance, oversight, execution, and support, making sure we have all those elements in place, independent functions for each. So an independent oversight function, similar to three lines of defense. If you're familiar with finance models and you're going to be familiar with the COSO cube, that is going to, you can see the, the cube is uh, very intimidating. But it effectively says for every business unit, for your entire organization, you're going to have these layers of defenses that will include, again, audit. You have to be able to survive an internal audit and you have to have confidence that your internal auditors are doing their job because otherwise when you have the external auditors come in, you're going to have a really bad day. So we get back into our TARDIS, we come back here. We now wanna be able to understand based off those standard themes, the compliance obligations, the legal obligations now, what does this mean for us? Well, putting the pieces together, the very first thing that we need to understand is again, revisiting what we just said in the very, very beginning. When I talk about NERC SIP, when I talk about the almost 20 years, which is hard to say, of understanding how requirements evolve, where you are today will allow you to understand where we're going to be. You have to understand that while, yes, absolutely, trend threats, trend the latest threat actors, understand how they may impact your environment, but also understand after they collect enough, after they build up enough, you're gonna start seeing actual requirements as sort of a wave that comes afterwards. So that peak is always gonna be there. There'll always be a lull. During those lulls, there'll be more threats and the peak will come back again. Embracing the idea of super forecasting. Even if you aren't very familiar with it, there's a lot of good like YouTube for free material. I don't recommend using ChatGPT. I did try to use AI when I, when I joked about that. ChatGPT did not like any requirement language standards whatsoever. Uh, I feel confident in my job and my familiarity in Excel apparently to keep on going. 
But if you could sort of take a break from that and understand, I need to know what's coming because my program has to be resilient for the future, not just based off of threats, but based off the laws that are coming. That puts you again in the same maturity, the same level as safety, the same maturity, the same level as finance. And that's where you absolutely need to be embracing towards. Also, no matter who you are, you're going to get impacted from something that happened in 2022. Uh, if you have questions on that, if you're, you want to come up to me afterwards during lunch, say I'm in this sector in this country, I will be able to give you a good sort of set of guardrails of what you should be looking at. The top three that I gave you are universal across all of them. That said, you really want to know the specific language because this is looking for that shift in culture. I didn't see, I mean, there were a lot of technical discussions in every single one of those, but where the regulation was pushing people is to changing the culture, changing your culture of security to embrace safety, to embrace production conversations, to embrace how your organization talks about outages. And again, if you're only talking about things in terms of jargon, CIA, AIC, however you want to order it, you're, you're missing the mark. You absolutely need to be talking about what this means from a safety perspective, a production perspective, outages, et cetera. And then we're entering a brand new world of what this looks like from the possible consequences to an organization. That is the key differential. That is the thing that I could say confidently to you why I could sort of predict what's gonna happen in the next 10 years, because that is what gets executives attention. And we've said this before in NERC SIP and we've never experienced anything like what's about to happen. Because even in the NERC SIP realm, we haven't had somebody come in after an incident and see what that looks like from potential charges. There's a scary thing there that people are definitely going to pay attention to. Look at any of the things that happened with Uber, with Anthem, any of the large legal cases that DOJ has taken, looking at the exact same guidelines I gave you, a lot of it had to do with what their compliance program is doing, which means compliance programs in ICS and OT aren't going away. They're only getting stronger as a result of that. So really want to make sure that you are aware of those things. Uh, again, I understand that most of you are probably not going to look through thousands of pages of documentation on requirement language. Hopefully this gives you an idea of what you should look out for though, because this change is coming. This is going to make it really difficult for folks. If you're interested in learning more about things like trending and super forecasting, that is a skill that we teach in ICS 418. Myself and Dean have done a lot of this with how do we bucket information, come up with what we should do next. And if you really want to know more about compliance, I also uh, teach ICS 456. I'm teaching it this week. Uh, so, of course, that Tim Conway co-authored with Ted Gutierrez, fantastic uh, sort of discussions on not only how do I technically go through this, so what are the technical provisions I need, but we spend a whole day just on what your compliance program should look like and the culture of compliance and what that means for you. And with that, happy to answer any questions that folks may have.